I'm Sharda Harrison. As a theater practitioner, I've been working 12 hour days for the past 10 years. I get five hours of sleep a night, and sometimes it feels like I'm running on pure adrenaline. In Singapore, where people have places to be and things to do, turns out I'm not alone. We are one of the most sleep deprived people in the world. <sighs> According to a study by US-based market research firm Wakefield, Singapore ranks second most sleep-deprived amongst developed nations. I want to know just how sleep-deprived we are and what we can do about it. There's a simple home test I found online to find out if you are sleep-deprived. And all you need is a metal spoon, a metal tray and a watch. For this test, I need three guinea pigs. My name is Mariah. My name is Ruby. I'm Dorothy. I'm currently secondary one. I'm usually on call outside of work for my clients. Due to irregular working hours of shift, I only managed to catch up to about 5 hours sleep per day. My normal sleep timing is about 11pm to 12 and I wake up at 5am every morning. I get about 6 to 6.5 hours of sleep per night. This spoon, believe it or not, is going to tell us if we are sleep deprived. Are we ready to take this test? Yep. Yeah. The official name of this experiment is the Sleep Onset Latency Test. It's a simplified version of an assessment used in sleep clinics to measure the time taken for a test subject to doze off. As the participant falls asleep, the spoon they're holding will naturally drop. The time taken to fall into a deep slumber indicates their level of sleep deprivation. If the spoon falls after 15 minutes, it means they are well rested. If it drops between 5 and 15 minutes, they're moderately sleep deprived. But if the spoon falls within 5 minutes, then it's very likely they have severe sleep deprivation. After the experiment, my producer announces the results. All right, so what are the results? You're all sleep deprived. We're all sleep deprived. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Why is that amazing? I'm quite surprised just because I thought I wasn't sleep deprived. I thought you know, having six to six and a half hours a day was pretty good. The four of us here, all of us are sleep deprived. Ruby, what about you? How do you feel being so young that you were the most sleep deprived? I should really be more conscious and really just plan my time more wisely so that I can sleep at usual timings like people my age about 10 plus yeah instead of like irregular timing like 12, 1. Ruby is 13 years old and needs at least 8 hours of sleep to develop and grow but a whopping 85% of teens here aren't getting that amount of sleep on a school night. And they aren't the only sleep deprived ones. In Singapore's bustling economy, we have one of the longest working hours in developed nations. A survey by local market research firm YouGov found that 44% of Singaporeans get less than seven hours of sleep. That's even less than Japan, another country known for its punishing work culture. At the other end of the spectrum, New Zealand is one of the most rested with eight hours and four minutes of sleep a day. So why is sleep so important? I'm meeting with Dr. Kenny Pang, an expert who spent two decades treating patients with difficulty sleeping. A lot of people think we sleep for our body, but actually we sleep for our brain. Sleep is a very active process. When we sleep, the brain actually converts short-term memory to long-term memory. In fact, studies have shown that children, after they study from school in the morning, they get home. After they have their lunch, they should have a short afternoon nap because that consolidates their memory, whatever they studied during the day, into long-term memory. How do I know how much sleep is optimal for me? or anybody? Yeah. Well, in general, it varies with age. I would say, for example, a child or toddler will require between 12 to 15 hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. As they grow older, maybe a teenager will require about 
eight to 12 hours of sleep. Yeah. In an adult, I would say the recommended sleep duration is about seven to nine hours. But I sleep about six to seven hours per day. When I conducted the sleep onset latency test, I was shocked to discover 13-year-old Ruby was severely sleep deprived. Ruby wakes up at 5 a.m. for school. Because of extracurricular activities, she will end her day only around 7.30 p.m. Then it's off to dance class till 9 p.m. She's back home at 10 p.m. with homework to tackle. On a good day, she goes to bed at 1 a.m. But when she has more homework like today, she is sometimes up till 3 a.m. I want to know how having such little sleep is affecting her life and schoolwork. Do you feel tired during the day? Normally during the day, I'll feel not really energetic as my friends and during CCA, I will feel definitely much more tired than most of my friends. Do you know what sleep deprivation is doing to your body? <laughs> not really. Well, that's why we're here today and that's why we're going to find out together. I've brought an expert to help Ruby. We're going to do some tests on you today, Ruby, to see how sleep deprivation may be affecting you. So I'm going to introduce you to Nick. He's a research assistant from the Cognitive Neuroscience Lab of Duke NUS. Let's, let's learn more about these tests. Okay, so um, today we'll be running you through a test battery consisting of uh, three computerized tasks. Ruby will be taking a series of computerized alertness and maths tests every hour. These test results will be analysed by Nick and his team later on. It's 3am now and I'm finally done with my schoolwork. I can finally head to sleep and I have to wake up at 5.30am tomorrow for school. Twelve hours later, Dr. June Lowe from the Sleep and Health Lab at Duke NUS and her team are analysing Ruby's data. Dr. Lowe has undertaken extensive research on the impact of sleep deprivation. I've brought Ruby to hear the outcome of these results. Here shown in uh, purple would be the performance of um, teenagers who are well rested. You were much sleepier than well rested teenagers. And then in the attention task that you did, actually you had many more slow responses than well rested teenagers. And then the final test you did was a mathematics test. So in this four minute test, the typical teenagers would be able to do 50 mathematical questions accurately. But you only managed to get about 25 correct. So all these actually means that you are very sleep deprived. I'd say you actually should be going to bed before 11.30. I feel really shocked about it because it's like a huge difference from normal teenagers, it's like 10 times more slow than typical teenagers my age. Mm -hmm. So Dr. June, what are the longer term effects of sleep deprivation? So other than cognitive decrement I've just shown you, mm -hmm. um, short sleep is associated with uh, reduced life expectancy and increased risks for various kinds of cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, as well as dementia. Ironically, the harder Ruby pushes herself, the worse she performs. She needs to break the sleeping cycle that she's developed. So to help her, I'm giving her a mission. So every night you're going to cut back your sleep by 15 minutes. This is sleep tracker here. It's going to track your sleep. Okay? Thank you. In a week's time, I'm going to check in with you to see how you're doing. But as her school workload grows, can Ruby adapt to a new sleeping schedule? Singapore is in the grip of a sleeping crisis. Nearly half our population is sleep deprived. But what bad habits are keeping us awake at night? 
before I sleep, sometimes I'm using my phone. I watch videos on YouTube for half an hour, and then after that, I go to sleep. Before I go to bed, I usually um, just scroll through my handphone and look through emails or social media. And I'll do that before, I mean, about 30 minutes to one hour before I sleep. Most people I spoke to said that they're usually on their devices before bedtime. They're not alone. A YouGov survey states that nearly 80% of Singaporeans use their phones and tablets before going to bed, which makes me wonder if our connectedness is making us sleepless. I want to find out if our nocturnal addiction to electronic devices is affecting how much we sleep. So I'm enrolling myself in a sleep lab back at Dr. Lowe's Centre. So we'll need to collect a couple of uh, saliva samples from you so that we can determine the level of the sleep inducing hormone melatonin. And then these electrodes will be placed over your head so that we can measure your brain activities, eye movements and muscle tone when you sleep. And then from those data, we can tell how long it actually takes you to fall asleep. Dr. Lo will be measuring the melatonin levels in my body. Melatonin is the hormone that regulates our natural body clock. Measuring it will indicate how ready we are to go to bed. Very glamorous. I feel a little bit like Frankenstein. On day one, I'm having my sleep latency and melatonin levels recorded where I stay away from any light-emitting device three hours before bedtime. On day two, I'm watching three hours of television before bedtime. I've been watching shows on my laptop and I'm completely awake. I don't feel tired at all. I don't want to sleep. I could stay awake for another hour. And in the earlier sleep test, I was reading a book. I, I felt that I was like struggling to kind of keep awake. I'm really surprised because it's something that I take for granted. So Dr. Jun, what do the test results say? So you spent two nights in the laboratory and in both nights, your bedtime was set at about midnight. During the night in which you read a book for about two and a half hours before your bedtime, we actually found the melatonin level, the sleep-inducing hormone level, to go up at about 11.30, so about half an hour before your usual bedtime. And then right before your bedtime, you reported that you were quite sleepy, and perhaps that's why you actually fell asleep quite quickly, I'd say at about um, 10 minutes past midnight. I was very sleepy. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, during the night, in which you binge-watched a lot of TV shows, <laughs> At 11.30, we actually didn't find any significant increase in the melatonin level. Wow. And right before your bedtime, you reported that you were still rather alert. And then it actually took you about 15 minutes to fall asleep that wow. night. So you can see that the difference is pretty huge in between the reading night and the binge-watching mm. night. So how do we get better sleep? Well, there are a number of things you can do. So firstly, from mid-afternoon onwards, you should avoid drinking caffeinated or energy drinks. And then in the evening, you should avoid bright light. Try to stick to warm lighting if possible. The very last and most important thing is that you need to stop using your electronic devices at least one hour before your bedtime. That's a difficult one. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope so too. And I hope to see you soon. Hmm, keeping away from my tablet and phone at least one hour before bed. That's easier said than done. But if it's going to delay my sleep and affect my health, then I'm going to have to give it a go. I've discovered a lack of sleep can damage our health and brain function. But does this apply to everyone? And every economy, Singapore's every first economy. Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, was an early riser thriving on just five hours of sleep a day. Former US President Barack Obama survives on five to six hours a night. And former UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was a notorious short sleeper, clocking in just four hours each night. So after digging around on the internet, I realized that some of these famous sleepers are just an exception. According to experts, they are genetically born to be able to function on less sleep. And 
Researchers estimate they make up only 3% of the entire population. So for the rest of us, we do need to get at least seven hours of shut eye. But if we can't clock in the hours, could power naps be the answer? Naps are more effective than caffeine. Is that true? been investigating what's keeping us awake at night and found out that we're paying the price for our sleep deprivation. Could naps be the solution? Although still rare, in 2016, napping facilities started to make its way into the Singapore market. I visit one of these facilities at Golden Village in Suntec City. Now, this is no regular cinema. Instead of buying a ticket to watch a movie, you can pay to get some shut eye. Let's go check it out. For $10, customers get one and a half hours at lunchtime to catch up on sleep. Pop on those earphones, recline the chair, and get some much needed rest. I managed to squeeze in about 20 minutes of nap time and I must say, I feel really refreshed. I wonder if there's a science behind taking naps. Dr. Liao Leong Chai runs the Sleep Disorders Unit, which has seen over 9,000 patients with sleep disorders since 2013. He's a strong advocate for daytime naps. So Dr. Liao, should naps be encouraged? Naps are certainly very effective at providing a boost to our energy levels, our alertness, our concentration, especially when we nap during parts of the day where naturally our body clock goes into a lull, typically after lunch. I've read that naps are more effective than caffeine. Is that true? Yes, that's true. There's a research paper from the UK and what they managed to show is that a short nap uh, it's actually better than drinking coffee in terms of getting a performance boost. If naps are so powerful, then can we use naps to replace the seven to nine hours of required sleep a day? Well, I think uh, only to a certain extent. Definitely uh, a good consolidated amount of sleep at night is still very crucial for health. So if you're not able to get the required amount of sleep at night, it's more important to identify the reasons why and to treat them appropriately. Is there an optimal duration for a power nap? Well, we think the ideal amount of nap shouldn't be longer than 30 minutes. You don't want to sleep any longer than 30 minutes because then your body might enter into deep sleep uh, so that when you do try to wake up after the nap, you know, you might feel very groggy. In my quest to help Singaporeans sleep better, I've also been trying out some sleeping apps. I realise most of them are meditation-based. So I'm going to try this now. I'm going to try just five minutes. Welcome to this five-minute deep sleep release. Let's take a moment to tune into the body. Three months, six months later. Meditation guru Vikas Malkani has written books on how meditation can dramatically improve our sleeping patterns. So I close my eyes and I visualize. Relax yourself. I've been on this journey to find out how we can get better sleep. So I've tried out some of these sleep apps on my phone and I realized that a lot of them are meditation based. Now, why do you think that's so? Meditation has a number of techniques and many of them are directly uh, focused on how to relax the body and relax the mind. So the benefit of that is that we can actually sleep better. So how effective do you think these sleep apps are to improve your sleep quality? A sleep app is a support system. It's a starting point, but it is not the only thing you should have. In other words, even if I need an app to sleep better, I'm dependent on the app. Mm. So let's say one day I don't have the app or I don't have internet connection, Wi-Fi connection. That means I can't sleep better. 
So what I need to do is to have my own method or my own system self-sustaining. So am I right to say that your classes that you run mm -hmm are helping people sleep. Every client who comes to us for training, we actually ask them what help they need, what issues they're having. And more and more we are finding that people come to us with uh, sleep issues. And we find that in a class of let's say 15 to 20 people, we will have at least four to seven people wow. mentioning that they have some sleep related issues. So that's a high percentage. I'm finding it very difficult to yeah. sleep well. And I'm going to teach you a couple of techniques that are going to help you to sleep better. I want you to take your attention now and place it on your breathing. As you breathe in, silently say, I breathe in. And as you breathe out, silently speak, I breathe out. It's now been a week since I challenged teenager Ruby to improve her terrible bedtime habits. I'm going to give her a call to get an update on how she's doing. Hi! Hi Ruby! How are you doing with the mission that I've given you? It's been really tough but I've been trying to improve my sleep patterns. Good, well I'm really glad to hear that they're improvements. Tell me about them. I didn't manage to sleep at 9pm but I managed to sleep at 10pm for one day which makes it 7 hours of sleep and I think that's a huge difference for me as I feel much more energetic and it takes me lesser time to wake up in the morning as well. Great, fantastic. So now you know why you have to keep this up, right? And yeah. try and sleep at 9pm every day so that you get 8 hours of sleep on a school night. Yep, that's why from now onwards, I'm going to improve my sleep patterns so that I can do better in school and sleep. Fantastic. Thank you, Ruby. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear Thank that. Thank you for the mission as well. I'm so happy. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm glad that Ruby is determined to change her sleep patterns. But so many of us struggle with a packed schedule and we compromise on our sleep. But I've learned that the consequences of this is very severe. We need to prioritize our sleep, no matter how busy we are, for our own health and sanity.